The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. Let's open our Bibles, if you would please, to the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 25. Exodus, I think most of you know, is the second book of the Bible. It's one of the five books of the law known as the Pentateuch that was written by Moses. And Moses is the man that God said, I have spoken to face to face. Imagine that. Moses had such a relationship with God. He's the only one in the Bible that we read that the Lord says that about. I'll speak to Moses face to face. These five books that begin the Bible are our guides to some very important information. We find in here the creation, the fall of man. There are famous stories like Noah and the ark, the worldwide flood. There are great human interest stories like the story of of Joseph and his rise from slavery to second in command in Egypt. In the Christmas season, one of, one of the things that I'm f- fond of saying is that Christmas began with the preaching of the gospel in Genesis, and that is with the Proto-Evangelium in Genesis 3.15. The birth of Jesus Christ is predicted before we get three chapters out or in the Bible done. Genesis then gives way to Exodus and the birth of Israel as a nation, and it begins the unfolding of God's plan of redemption in which his son would give his life for the sins of the world. Now, you are all familiar with the Bible, and by your handling of it, you, you know that you are here in the book of Exodus is a long way from the page that divides the Old and the New Testaments. It's a long way until you get to that dividing line of history between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And then when you get into the New Testament, into the book of Matthew, we're familiar that before we finish the first chapter of Matthew, we are now into the story of Jesus' birth. And then in chapter 2, there's the exciting adventure of the wise men who followed a star came from hundreds of miles away to find the one who was born to be the king of the world. The New Testament gospel accounts are the record of Jesus' ministry, of his exemplary life. They speak of his compassion for the people who were spiritually helpless. Jesus said they're as a sheep, as sheep that have no shepherd. And we learn in the gospel accounts that despite his love and compassion, and his perfect life, that he was despised, that he was rejected. And at the young age of 33 years, he was nailed to a cross and crucified. But we also know that the story doesn't end there because he couldn't be the promised Messiah unless he arose from the grave, unless he lives. He must be alive. He must come again to be the king who will rule the world in perfect righteousness. From Exodus to Matthew, that's a long, long way. And and if you've read the Bible, you know that there's much happens in those 4,000 years from Genesis 1 to Matthew 1. But unfortunately, most people do not know that the story of Jesus does not begin in Matthew. Jesus does not exist because of his birth in Bethlehem. I I was reading this week, and I think this came from, uh, I didn't write down, I don't even remember, remember the source, but I think this was from um, Christianity Today. And I'm just going to read just one small part here. It says, less than half of Americans, including just 63% of church-going Christians, believe Jesus existed before his virgin birth in Bethlehem, a new study from LifeWay Research shows. The study conducted September 3rd through 14th through an online survey of a national pre-recruited panel of 1,005 Americans shows that only two in five 
or 41% of American adults in general believe Jesus existed before his Bethlehem birth. Some 32% disagree with the idea that Christ existed before his Bethlehem birth, while 28% say they are not sure. And then it goes on to say that among Christians who attend church four times a month or more, only 63% of the people gave an answer that Jesus existed before Bethlehem. Does that tell us that Christianity, quote unquote Christianity, is in a very, very sorry condition in our country? The very fundamental fundamentals of Christianity, of course, would be that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the eternal Son of God, that He existed. He was pre-existent to Matthew 1. But in Matthew chapter 1, the eternal God became incarnate. That, of course, is a theological word that means that He became human flesh. I mean, that is the main point of Christmas, that God became human flesh. So in Matthew 1, Jesus became a baby to grow into manhood in order to establish a new covenant with his people. But we also have the Old Testament. And because Jesus came in the New Testament to establish a new covenant does not mean that he can't be found in the Old Testament in the Old Covenant. We have the Old Covenant to help us to understand what Christ would do in the New Covenant. And so what we're doing now is studying Christmas from the Old Testament scriptures. So if you look here in Exodus chapter 25, we're going to turn our attention to the most sacred of Israel's symbols that represented to them the presence of God. This is the Ark of the Covenant, also known as the Ark of Testimony. On the screen, our, our next slide will show you an artist's conception that you can visualize the scriptures as we read. So Exodus 25, beginning in verse number 8. I'll just read down to verse number 16. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. This is the description of the ark of the covenant. The construction of it continues in verses 17 through 22, but we're going to separate that out and make a, a different study of that part of it, and we'll get the significance of those verses at a later time. Now, the first part of this chapter, uh, Exodus 25, records the Lord's command for, for Moses to instruct the people to bring an offering of materials that would be used in the construction of the tabernacle, the tabernacle that is a tent, and all the various furnishings that would go in it. Israel was told to make a sanctuary. And before telling them how to build this sanctuary or to make it, the narrative here in chapter 25 goes immediately to the first furnishing that was to be placed in the tabernacle, and that was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if you were here in our previous studies of the tabernacle, uh, I, I have saved the most significant part of it for last. In fact, if we had the old numbering system for these sermons, uh, this would have been the 40th sermon in that series. 
And it was my thought that what we would do is to bring this series to a climax, to a triumphant end, in which we would see Jesus to the fullest extent of his deity that all the symbols of the tabernacle could represent. The Ark of the Covenant is the most significant and sacred of all of Israel's possessions. And it remained that way throughout all of Jewish history. And Jewish people today still expect that one day they will have a new Ark of the Covenant or that they will find the old one. Many believe that the Ark was hidden by Jeremiah before the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem about 500 years before Christ came and that somewhere beneath centuries of rubble the Ark of the Covenant is there and they will find it and then it will be placed in a new temple that will one day be rebuilt. Well, I chose to put the ark at the end of the series or near to the end of this series, whereas the Bible does it a different way. I chose in our studies that we would look at the coverings of the tabernacle, that we would look at the construction of the fence, that we would talk about the gate of entrance. I chose to look at the framework of it, the skins of animals that were used to overlay that framework. I chose to speak of the brazen altar, of the brazen labor, to teach you about the golden lampstand, about the table for bread, about the altar of incense. I then went into the a study of the priest garments, and then we talked about the five sacrifices that were offered throughout the year of uh, Israel's liturgical calendar. I chose all of those before we came to this sermon on the Ark of the Covenant. But the Bible puts the Ark first because of its critical purpose in the Old Testament economy. Now it's true that all the preceding parts that I've just mentioned, all of them speak about Jesus Christ in one way or another. They are symbols of Christ. And, and you may remember, I've said on many occasions that the tabernacle is the Bible's most comprehensive description of Christ and his work of redemption. Every part of tabernacle worship is about Christ. But the highest, most revered, the most sacred of all is the Ark of the Covenant. It stands above all the rest in its display of the Savior. The Ark of the Covenant was first in God's instructions because it was to receive the most prominence. It is the most important enduring symbol of the presence of God. If you were a visitor to the tabernacle and take note that you never could be, what we just read a moment ago in the book of Joshua would be about as close as you would ever get or I would. 3,000 feet, that's about as close as we would get I think. The tabernacle was sacred and holy, and only the priest was allowed to see the interior of it. Only the high priest was able to see the various furnishings, or was able to go into the most sacred of all the compartments to see the Ark of the Covenant and the glory of God. But if you could walk into the tabernacle, you would walk in... Uh, into the eastern end of the tabernacle and on your right would be a small table with 12 loaves of fresh, freshly baked bread. On your left would be a, a lampstand or what we would call today a menorah. In front of you, maybe about 25 feet away, there would be a very small altar called the altar of incense and then at 30 feet in front of you there would be a floor to ceiling curtain that was called the veil. Some, if you look at this curtain over here, it'd actually be taller than the curtain that we have there. But this curtain would go from the floor to the ceiling, and behind that curtain was the Ark of the Covenant. And this curtain, this veil, was not to be opened except on one day of the year. It was to be opened only on Israel's most sacred day of worship, and that was the Day of Atonement. The Ark of the Covenant was an ornate box. Behind that curtain was a very ornate box, the Ark of the Covenant. It was the place where, where God showed His glory in a brilliant light that indicated His presence with the people. God was there, but He could only be accessed 
one time during the year as the priest brought in the blood of atonement to sprinkle on the mercy seat. Now I chose to tell you about this part last, but God's instructions were reversed. He started with the display of himself and how that he would be evidenced among the people. In this visible, brilliant light of God, we have a representation of Jesus Christ. Now, I hadn't really intended to do that, this, but if, if you would look for just a moment in Matthew chapter 17, I think you're familiar with this. Uh, we, I didn't put it on the, on the screen there. But in Matthew chapter 17, I just want to, to show you this scripture. You're familiar with it. This is at the transfiguration of Jesus. Matthew 17, verse number 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Peter, James, and John saw the glory of Jesus Christ. And in the tabernacle, this brilliant light was was about Jesus Christ. It was about the one who is both God and man. Now we know that the Bible teaches that God is an invisible spirit. We can't see God. But in this ark is the foreshadowing that God would become visible. That he would become visible in the manhood of Jesus Christ. While still possessing all of the attributes of the most holy invisible God. He would become incarnate. He would become flesh. And that gave us the prospect that humans would have, could have, intimate fellowship with the triune God. Now, if you would just stop and think about that for just a moment, you're used to reading the gospel accounts. In this time of year, uh, you read about the manger scene. You read the nativity. You see angels and wise men and the baby Jesus. But the possibility that the invisible, infinite God could come as a helpless baby is simply inconceivable. There is no way that we can wrap our heads around that. There is no way that we could understand how that could take place. And yet 1,500 years before Christ came, the Israelites were already introduced to the immensity of God who would come in human flesh. This is what the ark represents. It represents the God-man. And the ark is such enduring, substantial imagery that we find it often in the Old Testament scriptures. It captured the attention of not only Israel, but all the nations that fought with Israel too. And they found the ark to be ominous, to be mysterious, and to be a frightening thing. And I might mention that Israel was not the only nation to have an ark. The, the Hebrew word ark simply means box. It was a box. Not an Amazon box, but it was a box. Other ancient people had boxes in their religion too. They, the difference was their arks contained images of their gods. Israel was forbidden to make images. The only things that were in the Ark of the Covenant were a golden, was a golden pot of manna, there was a stick that blossomed, and there were the stone tablets of the law that were engraved with the finger of God. In ancient times, an ark or box was used to, an ornate box like this was used to uh, contain or hold important documents such as copies of treaties between nations. When one nation was conquered by another, articles of servitude were drawn up and a copy of the treaty between the nations was put into an ark and it was given to the lesser nation, to the conquered nation, and they were to be obedient to keep the treaty. In God's ark, there was also a treaty. There was a covenant. These were the commandments that God gave to Israel. God covenanted with his people, but it was not up to them to enforce or to keep the covenant. 
they couldn't keep treaty with God because what God requires is always perfect obedience. They were sinful and they were never able to keep the law perfectly. Last week we read about this in Hebrews chapter 8. In Hebrews 8 verse 9 it says that Israel did not continue in the covenant because of the weakness of human flesh. Because none of us can live perfectly. Because we are all sinners. There is no way that this covenant could be kept by man. So this covenant was placed into the ark to be kept by God himself. God is the one who's the surety of the covenant. The peace between God and man is kept only by him. And that's through his son Jesus Christ. As Paul wrote, for he is our Peace. Hebrews 13 says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you see this? The everlasting covenant is sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is perfect. He is what causes us to be well-pleasing to God. He reconciled us through his blood to the Father. He gave us perfect peace between us and God, our creator. And so the law was placed into the ark to be kept by Christ, the one who is the antitype of the ark. And this is what Jesus did when he came into the world. He kept the law of God perfectly for us because we never could. Canaanites and Assyrians, Babylonians, Medes and Persians, they never understood Israel's God. They never enjoyed peace. They saw the ark as an amulet. They saw it as a as an idol. It was like a good luck charm to them, as if Israel's God could be placed into a box and carried around just like they carried their gods. Now you might wonder, why would I talk about the Ark of the Covenant today? Why would we reach back now, 3,500 years in history, to talk about the Ark of the Covenant? Is it still significant for modern Christians? And the answer to that question is yes, that we are God's people and we are living under an everlasting covenant. How enduring is that covenant? Well, in Revelation chapter 11, it tells us there is an ark of testimony in heaven. That in heaven, in a temple in heaven, heavenly, the heavenlies are the pattern for the earthly that Moses made, there was an ark of this testimony in heaven. Now that shows us, I think, that New Testament Christians need to know the significance of the ark. We need to know the reason that God had this little box that's made of wood and covered with gold and has a crown around the top, a border around the top, made like a crown, Why did God give Israel this little box for their worship? Our interest in that, I think, should be intensified because of what we read in Revelation chapter 11. There is an ark of testimony in heaven. It should be, our interest should be intensified because unlike other articles in the tabernacle that spoke mostly of Christ's work, this one... The Ark of the Covenant speaks of Christ as a person. Who is he? How does he stand in relation to the Godhead? This is the most important part, isn't it? Isn't this the thing that we really need to know? Who is Jesus Christ? What does he mean to us? What is the importance of Jesus Christ? And that question actually reverberates throughout the world of religion. Who is he? Well, the Muslims call him a prophet. The Mormons say that he was created. They say that he is one iteration of God. And that maybe someday you could have the same position that he has as a God. Most say that he was a good man. But there are only a few that recognize him 
as the God of heaven and earth. The one who is exalted. The one who commands repentance and faith. The one who must be believed and received. Or there is eternal destruction. He is the one to whom everyone must yield and bow the knee in unconditional surrender. Now let me emphasize this today first in our study. Number one is the focal point of worship. The focal point of worship. Israel did not make idols. There was no figure that represented God. They had no statues to bow to in worship. Every idol makes God in our image. The reason that we don't have Christ hanging on a cross, the reason that we don't wear a crucifix, is because Christ on a cross is a terribly incomplete representation of him. A crucifix degrades Jesus. Because an idol can only show him as a man. An idol is an abomination to God. An idol confines God. But our God is too big. Our God is too magnanimous. Our God is too magnitudinous to be displayed in trinkets hanging at the end of rosary beads. God permitted no idols. But he did permit symbols of his power and glory. When Solomon prayed at the dedication of the temple, he said that God could not be contained in this magnificent house that he built. And yet, at the Ark of the Covenant, the God who could not be confined, who could not be contained, descended to make his presence known in a confined space. Space was not a magnificent temple, not like the heathens, not, not like the ancient ruins of Heathen temples that were astounding. The Parthenon at the, on the Acropolis in Athens is still standing after 2,000 years because it was such a magnificent, substantial piece of architecture. When Paul preached at Ephesus, he stood in the shadow of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That was the temple of Diana. That was the pride and joy of that city. But when God chose to display himself, it was on top of a box, a rectangular box, 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. This small box had two cherubim, that is two angels with outstretched wings that touched each other at the wing tips. And this box and those cherubim were the captivating point, focal point of Israel's worship. Now, I think of that little box and then compare it to other things that people worshipped in the Bible. And especially, I'm taken to the story of the idol that Nebuchadnezzar made of himself and required all of his kingdom to worship. His image stood 90 feet tall on the plains of Dura. And you could see, they could see this image for miles around. But Israel's God chose to show himself in a small space on top of a box that would have been dismissed as nothing if God had not shown his power through it so many times. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And in this dream, there was a, a great image with a head of gold. It had a breast and, and, and arms of silver, a belly of brass. The legs were of iron. The feet were iron mingled with clay. It was a formidable, formidable image, a very powerful image that stood for the mightiest kingdoms of the earth. But then Nebuchadnezzar saw a stone. He saw a perfectly cut stone, not a chiseled one by man's hands, but a stone that was dislodged from a high mountain. And this stone came tumbling down and struck that image and shattered it to pieces. The image was ground to powder and it blew away like chaff in the wind. The stone that rolled down the mountain grew into a, into a mountain itself that filled the entire earth. And that stone is a stone of stumbling for the self-righteous. That stone represented Jesus Christ who crushes all opposition. 
Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls will be ground to powder. So do you see the contrast between uh, the world's gods, the heathen gods, pagan gods, and the God of heaven and earth? The God of heaven and earth cannot be contained. And the God of heaven and earth is unconcerned about what you think of him and what people think that he should be. Though he may choose to show his presence in a small space, he is still present everywhere in the universe in his entirety. God cannot be divided. You can't put him on a crucifix and still worship him as the true God. So the ark was the focal point. It represented Jesus Christ as a person, as God, as the ultimate supreme God. Now the truth that we need to know is who is Jesus Christ, the person. Now when he came to the earth, people didn't recognize who he truly was. He told them that he was one with the Father, but they didn't know him, they didn't believe him. Their best assessments of him always fell short. Now most would consider, um, they would consider it to be a, a compliment to be compared to Jeremiah or to Isaiah, to any of the great prophets. If you said, Pastor Smith, you, you preach like Moses, I would say, wow, that's right, I do. That's, that's, that's a great compliment. Being compared to any of the prophets, that, that would be a major compliment. But that's never enough for Jesus. In Matthew 16, 13, Jesus asked the disciples who the people thought he was. They thought, well, perhaps he's a dead person that's come back to life. Maybe he's one of the prophets from the Old Testament. Some say that, they said, some say that you're John the Baptist. Now, that, at that point, John the Baptist had been killed by Herod. Uh, some say that you're John the Baptist. Or some say Elijah or Jeremiah are one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked, but who do you say that I am? And Peter replied, you are the Christ. You are the Son of of the living God. And when Peter said he was the Christ, I know, I hope you understand that Christ is the same word as Messiah. That is a decidedly Old Testament connection, isn't it? Peter said, you are the Messiah. You are the one that's talked about in the Old Testament. You are Jehovah God from the Old Testament. All of the other representations of Christ in the tabernacle would be useless if we don't know who he is. Why was the crucifixion of this man more significant than hundreds or even thousands of others that died on crosses? Is it because he was such a good fellow? Is it because he had a heart of compassion? Is it because, well, his death was a travesty of justice? No. Dying on a cross means nothing unless the one who died on the cross was God. There's much compromised information about him. I, I, I've never met anyone who said that Jesus was a bad man. Like Jews in Israel that complimented him as prophet-like. That's just incomplete. That's not enough to save one soul from hell. Jesus must be recognized as God. He is the focal point of worship because he alone grants access to the Father. Jesus Christ alone satisfied the Father for our sins. Jesus Christ alone is the only one who can give us eternal life. Well, where was this Ark of the Covenant placed? Well, it was put into the Holy of Holies. The holiest place of a tabernacle. It was put into a place of the most difficult access for humans because it brought the person into the presence of the righteous God. In God's presence, angels echo, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and is to come. This is the one that multitudes fall before and say, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. They say blessing and honor and glory and power be unto the one that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever 
and ever. This is who Jesus is. He's the one who sits on the throne. This is how he is to be recognized. Jesus is not your chum. Though he is the friend of sinners, he's not your bosom buddy. He's not someone that you can throw your arms around and cuddle with. And let me just say this. I'm going back now to what I said in the message about worship a few weeks ago. I cringe to hear preachers bring Jesus down to a frat friend. I cringe to hear him spoken of in terms of familiarity with a squishy, lovey-dovey, moon-pie eyes kind of friendship. I despise a rock-out, wild atmosphere making Jesus a party animal. They call it worship. I call it disrespect. I despise when there is no holiness, no purity, and no honor accorded to Jesus Christ. It's pulling him down to a base level and making him in our image. I can't imagine Jesus in the hip-hop rap music of gangsters. I can't imagine him in the guitar riffs of musicians who look like they just came off a drug high before church started. Now you can color me old-fashioned if you want. I'd much rather be an ancient Israelite with respect and fear of God than to be an ingrate intruder upon God's presence. He is Almighty God. He deserves more respect and honor than we can give. Reverence is owed to Him. He's the holy God who sits on the throne as majestic Lord and King. Now the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies with its highly restricted access told Israel that there was something exceptional about the Ark and what it represented. Why is the Ark the focal point of worship? Because Jesus Christ is the focal point. All of God's power is vested in Him and Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is what it says in Colossians. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. You can make yourself familiar with that if you want, but I dare not do anything other than to hide behind him in the brightness of his glory. Like the publican who would not even lift his eyes to heaven but smote upon his breast and said, God be merciful to me a sinner. That's how high and holy Jesus is. And yet, many church services are not about him. They're all about the power of you. You are the most awesome being in the universe. And there is more worship of people than there is of Christ. What did the ark represent? Well, first, and this is as far as I'll get today. What did it represent? It represented a sacred throne and the presence of God. The ark of the covenant represented the throne of God. I've just shown you who is on God's throne. And I'll, I'll discuss more of that in another message. But I want you to look at verse number 12 in Exodus 25. In verse number 12 it says, And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in one, the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it, and thou shalt make staves of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. Now that might all be a little bit confusing to you. But it talks about the rings of gold and the staves. This was what was used to lift the ark to transport it. The way it was carried was always on the soldiers of the priest. And these rings were positioned near the bottom of the ark so that it was, when it was hoisted up on the shoulders of the priest, it would be high above their heads. In other words, it was like carrying a throne, like carrying a monarch above their head as they did kings in those days. In David's time, when Uzzah and Ahio put the ark on an ox cart to carry it, they disobeyed God's command. Remember, we discussed that when speaking of God's prescription for worship. 
And when the oxen shook the cart, Uzzah reached out to steady it, and God struck him dead. The ark was not common. It was not to be touched. David was displeased with the Lord's action, but he knew enough not to challenge God. And from that time, David feared the ark. And I'm telling you, here is the problem in churches today. Christ is common. He's not feared. He's not respected as high and holy. He's not seen as sitting on a throne surrounded by angels who respect and adore his presence. People miss Christmas by so far. It's not like it's not even God who's in Christmas. Where is Christ now? Is he, is he sporting about in ripped jeans, attending the church jam session? Is that where he is? Let, let me clarify this for you. Hebrews 9.24, again, a scripture we read last week. For Christ is not entered into holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Where is he? He is in a high and holy place far beyond church buildings that are built by human hands. He appears in the presence of God for us. When the priest went into the inner sanctuary, he was greeted by the presence of God in a brilliant light that was called the Shekinah. Now you won't find the word Shekinah in the Bible. It's a transliteration of a Hebrew word that means that which dwells. In the 8th verse, God said... Let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's how God dwelled with them. This is the place. It was in the Holy of Holies at the Ark of the Covenant. In verse number 22 of chapter 25, God said, There I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee. Now, we step back and wonder. We contemplate, why did God... Why would God do this? Who are these people? Who are these people that God said that he would commune with? Aren't these the same ones that paused at the Red Sea to murmur that Moses led them out of Egypt to be destroyed? Aren't they the same ones that, that while Moses was talking to God on the mountain, they were down in the valley making an idol that God said you should never make. They were worshiping Something that they made and calling it the God who brought them out of Egypt. Why would the infinite God condescend to display himself in a small room on a small box to be present with a defiant, complaining people who constantly challenged his sincerity, his providence, his authority? Why? But that's exactly what Jesus did, didn't he? It's the same God. And he's dealing with the same kinds of people. He healed people from all their diseases, and yet he was betrayed by his own people. He was mocked and cursed. He came to earth to save his people from their sins, but they rejected him. And yet, while still hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then approximately 50 days later, he sent his Holy Spirit and Peter preached a message of forgiveness. And in Peter's convicting, gut-wrenching sermon, God graciously opened their hearts. They saw what they had done and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And at that very moment, they were hopeless because they had crucified the Son of God. But Peter gave an answer. That could heal them. Repent. Trust Jesus Christ. He offers complete forgiveness. And this is what Jesus did. He stepped down to deal with us. On the first Christmas. The word was made flesh. Grace and truth came to live. With undeserving humans. And there the graciousness of God. At the age of 33 years of Jesus Christ. Was displayed at the cross. In the Old Testament, there in that Holy of Holies that represented God's throne room, Israel dwelt in safety. 
This is one of the most precious aspects of God's presence. Where God is, there is favor, there is protection from the awful consequences of our sin. And did you know this is one of the most important aspects of the symbolism of the ark? There are three arks in scripture. All of them speak of safety. First, there's Noah's ark. Noah was among eight that were sealed shut inside the ark when it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. They were protected in safety from the waters of the flood. The ark was sealed, Noah's ark was sealed with pitch. And that's a very interesting word. Pitch is an interesting word because, and the concept of pitch, that, that comes from a word that means atonement. The ark represented the safety of Christ, safety in Christ. No storms, no water, no danger could penetrate that ark when God shut Noah and his family in. The second ark was the ark of Moses. In Exodus chapter 2, Moses' mother made an ark of bulrushes and sealed it with, guess what? Pitch. And there was little helpless baby Moses in the ark. She didn't know. His mother didn't know where it would float. She placed it close to the riverbank. And it was guided by God. And it wasn't long before Pharaoh's daughter came to bathe. And she found him and had compassion on him. Now for Moses, that ark was an ark of safety. Guided under the providential care of Almighty God. In both cases... Pitch and the ark point us to Jesus Christ. He makes us safe with God. His blood of atonement satisfied the Father. It makes us perfect. It enables us to come into the presence of the Holy God. And then the third ark is the one that we're reading about. God commanded Israel to make the ark of the covenant. It, it, it's the place of safety because God's presence was there. The sacred throne was there. It was God's throne come down to dwell with his people. Now after we finish this series, we're going to talk about the cloud that rested on the tabernacle. God was in the Holy of Holies and when he was there, there was a cloud that rested over the back part of the tabernacle. And that cloud gave them confidence of God's protection. And that cloud was with them through 40 years of Israel's wandering. Only when they had crossed the Jordan River and were ready to take Canaan did, did that cloud disappear. And it only came back on special occasions. But the point of all that is that God was determined to get them there. They were safe with God. God promised he would get them there. That is, the nation would arrive intact. Most of Israel that came out of Egypt did not get to the promised land because of unbelief. Not all of the individuals were preserved, but the nation was. And there was a new generation that possessed the land. And when Cain was conquered, the cloud wasn't seen except on special occasions. Now, now here is the point then for us as Christians today. What Jesus Christ did was to send his Holy Spirit to be with us. To be always present with us. To be Christ in us who never leaves us throughout the entire journey of life. He never fails to guarantee our entrance into heaven at the end. We're safe because he's always with us. The spirit was given to us as a guarantee of our inheritance. God promised he would bring us to final salvation. And he put the stamp on it, the seal on it with his Holy Spirit. And that is a marvelous doctrinal picture that comes right out of the tabernacle and the presence of God with his people. He promised never to leave us or forsake us. We fail him so many times, but it was never our ability that guaranteed anything with God. Not even the smallest thing with God is guaranteed by anything that we do. He is the covenant keeping God. The lesser is always kept by the greater. He never depends on us to keep covenant. Let me quote from Daniel Hyde in his book, God in Our Midst. We'll let this close the message today. Daniel Hyde wrote, The fact that the ark was the place of the Lord's presence among his people brought great assurance to the people of God. 
This high, lofty, majestic, and resplendent king dwelt among his grumbling, complaining, bickering, and sinful people. Does that sound familiar? We too are grumbling, complaining, bickering, and sinful people. Thankfully, God is not far off in another land, but he is near to us who are sinners. The promise to the new covenant believer is that the Lord is near to us by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, even as Jesus promised his helpful presence. So if you ask me, why, why do I preach about the Ark of the Covenant? I preach about it because the Ark of the Covenant is good teaching for New Testament Christians. Now for most people, the only thing they know about the tabernacle is the ark. They, they haven't heard much, much teaching about it, and they're probably more familiar with the ark from that great prophet Indiana Jones. <laughs> Some are interested in the ark because of the movies, like Moabites and Amalekites and Edomites and Canaanites. They're fascinated by the, by the uh, mystical, supernatural powers of the ark, but how little do they know that the mystery of the ark is not the dark occultic powers of the devil, the mystery is not the ark itself. The mystery is the glory and the holiness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. How much more informed and blessed would people be if they could see Jesus in the ark? The focal point of all worship must be Jesus Christ. In this Christmas season, we must not lose the majesty of Christ. Lose it in worldly entertainment and drunken parties. Let's be sure that Jesus Christ receives all the glory he deserves. Let's be sure that we worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's be thankful to Jesus Christ who accomplished his father's will by coming to this earth. At first as a helpless baby. Thank God for salvation born in a manger. Blessed be God for the Christmas gift of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Brian Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Roner Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org.